Hello, everybody. Welcome to our webinar today. I'm Chris Madrid French, and next to me is uh, John Haber here in front of one of my favorite roadside icons. Um, and we have an hour long program here today. So I just wanted to go over a few basic things before we get going. Um, thank you all for attending. We're very excited about the five panelists we have today. Uh, each panelist will be presenting for about eight minutes and then we'll close with questions. As we normally encourage people, you can use the Q&A box uh, and please do use the Q&A box if you're in Zoom. If you're in some of the other streaming platforms, we recommend that you use the comment box and we'll keep an eye on those for the question and answer period. We have about 10 minutes for questions today. Chris, would you like to turn us over to the first speaker? John, you know, I always have something else to say first, <laughs> and we need to hit record. I always forget that. Well, John's getting all of us set up in the background there with recording uh, and our closed recording captioning. in progress. I would just like to say that welcome to everyone. We have a very fast program going today, and we welcome you to use the chat window the entire time that we're in the program. We do post links, and you will see your friends in the chat. Uh, I saw my friend Nelson and my friend Mark are in there, and I see Christopher. There's all kinds of people in there. So if the chat window does disturb your experience, you can pull it to the side or minimize it. And also, uh, be uh, sure to use the Q&A box. So we have five panelists today and they're only talking for eight minutes each. At the very end, John and I will pop on with everybody and we'll take as many questions as we can. Uh, and so we would like to get started. It's gonna be so much fun. I wanna introduce Barton. First, you wanna go ahead and turn on your camera and we can start sharing your slides. Welcome, Martin. <laughs> Thank you, Christine. I am so glad to be here, believe me. All right, I'm going to stop my video. You want to go ahead and share? Okay. All right, there you go. All right. Mm, kind of strange message there for a second. Sorry, let's get started. Okay, I'm Martin True. Um, I wrote a book a few years ago called Signs, Streets, and Storefronts, um, which addresses the relationship of signs and architecture. Um, uh, over 200 years of American history, which is quite a big subject. Today, I'm gonna focus on post-war architecture and signs. Um, I began to take photographs of signs and architecture in earnest in the early 1980s. And um, for me, signs are, it's so important to see them in context. Sign and architecture, sign and streetscape, sign and site. And though I often speak um, using images from um, the past, I'm gonna focus entirely, all my images will be of things that I've actually become acquainted with and that I photographed myself. Um, this first image is one of my favorites. I took this photograph in Chicago on State Street in the early 90s. Um, this is important to me because it shows the uh, post-war jump in scale for signs in the city. Signs started taking up whole um, building fronts, going up three and four or five stories to get their message across in the automobile age. Um, this sign uh, no longer exists. Um, this building is a very important building architecturally to Chicago architecture. So they stripped everything away restored the building. It's the Reliance Building um, by Daniel Burnham's firm. And unfortunately, this layer of history is gone. I speak a lot about layers of history and I miss all these accretions of time that you see here. Um, here's a building, an older building that was updated in the early 1940s in Chicago, uh, updated with um, pigmented uh, porcelain enamel panels, which keep vibrant colors going for decades and decades. Um, so older building updated, uh, the whole first floor is a sign virtually with its graphics and color. You've got the uh, projecting sign, uh, which adds to the effect. This is really right around the corner for me. I feel very blessed to be so nearby and that they have kept this um, intact for so many years. Um, this is a place uh, just outside of Pittsburgh in McKeesport, uh, Pennsylvania. 
Another example of that early 1940s or late 30s updating of an older building, uh, this is done with um, uh, terracotta panels. I love the unique lettering that rests on this very slim little canopy, very elegant updating of an older building. Uh, it's in a bit of disrepair right now. That's part of where it is. Um, this example in Chicago, um, a bit more recent, well, relatively, it's uh, from the late 1950s. And even though it's an urban site and sort of addresses its urban context by being right on the sidewalk, it's also a suburban solution. As you can see, there's a parking lot, but we have these terrific uh, letters wall-mounted letters, um, an old tradition, which is updated for the late 1950s, early 1960s. We also see a combination of wall sign and the projecting sign on the corner there, uh, the shape uh, or shapes, which relate so much to the roof line of the architecture. That's a passion of mine, um, signs that relate in design to the buildings whenever possible. This is in a small town, Toluca, Ohio. And one of my favorites, it is tremendous scale for this little town. Um, and it was an updating, um, even though it's on a newer building, it's an updating of the streetscape for the automobile age, catching the eye of the motorist, uh, people going through town quickly. Um, and um, I love the superstructure that holds this sign up. I love the shape of the sign. It's an animated sign. Um, it does so much to bring life to this um, streetscape. Uh, another great sign. This is in Chicago. Beautifully intact, still going, very much beloved by the neighborhood. Um, completely takes over the facade of this uh, urban building. A beautiful example of 1940s, 1930s sign relating to the architectural design. They're all you know, integrated, responding to each other. This is a very important image. This is in uh, New Orleans. Uh, some of these signs no longer exist, however. But um, you see layers of time here. The buildings are from the 1850s. The canopies and railings are from the 1890s. The signs originally for from the uh, early 1910s, 1920s, then updated with neon. Um, what I find so exciting about this though in particular is that um, this was a block where you could see what urban street state, excuse me, urban streetscape still looked like um, back in the heyday of signs when they were everywhere, they were concentrated. Um, it's um, a little, glimpse into the past. Um, then I have a great passion for cinema signs, especially cinema signs from the um, early post-war period, like late 1940s. This is from Columbus, 1946. Beautiful integration of lettering and a graphic um, composition. Uh, a very ambitious sign uh, in um, Great Bend, Kansas. Um, you know, the, the, the frontage of the building is responding to the streetscape. I mean, it's part of the continuous wall of the street, but it's undulating and becoming something independent on its own. And I, I appreciate that independence yet, um, that cooperation, let's say, of the architecture. A great example of layers of history. You can see the old terracotta sign between the towers. And then this marquee that was added on in the uh, post-war period, probably early 1950s. Beautiful script. Very important place. Many of you know this uh, and we'll probably be speaking about it later, but I think this is one of the most incredible urban spaces in America. This dynamic between these two uh, cinema marquees, cinema tower on the left, the, curve uh, facade of the one on the right. And there's a sort of yin yang going on here, a real supercharged uh, relationship, um, you know, projecting and receding. Um, just standing there is an electric experience. My favorite rooftop sign in Miami um, from 1938, Igor Polovitsky, the architect designed the lettering here, fantastic. 
the dimensional lettering, the deep letters, the alignment of the lettering with the lines of the building, the beautiful script, the unique, or excuse me, the beautiful uh, vertical um, compressed typeface, gorgeous and so appropriate to a tower uh, application. And now I'm gonna jump through very quickly, just a few suburban signs that I love very, very much because I just couldn't leave them out. They're so important to me. Some of my favorites, there are many, many of them that I love, but um, so glad that these are still around and cared for so well. This was Las Vegas in Florida. This was all over Florida, a chain, and the sign had great movement. They called it the waterfall sign because the, the center pylon cascaded, the neon effect cascaded and was supercharged, fantastic to experience. And one of the first signs I ever photographed, I fell in love with sign ruins. I confess, I do have a love of ruins, but I also love signs that are preserved. That's all. Thank you, Martin. Um, I think the next speaker we'll be jumping over to is Jeremy Ebersole. So we'll have him jump on. Um, perfect timing, Martin. So thank you for that. Uh, now we're going to jump over to uh, Jeremy here. Great. Thank you. Thank you. Let's get this going here. And very good. Thank you so much, everyone. Uh, I'm Jeremy Ebersole. I'm very pleased to be here on the board of directors of the Society for Commercial Archaeology, uh, which I'll talk about in a bit. Uh, I'm privileged to be the executive director of the Milwaukee Preservation Alliance here in Milwaukee, Wisconsin as well. And what you're seeing here is my votes for the coolest uh, sign and roadside attraction uh, here in, in Milwaukee, uh, 1942. Uh, this is actually the 1950s remodel. And this is, of course, a frozen custard stand, uh, which I highly recommend that when you're in Milwaukee, we have more frozen custard stands uh, per capita than anywhere in the country. Uh, and in fact, there's a book written about it. You can find them all, uh, dozens and dozens in, in the region uh, here. Uh, great, great attractions. Um, but I'm not going to spend too much time talking about uh, the, the, uh, um, uh, the custard stands here. I'm going to chat about primarily neon signs, uh, which were the subject of my, uh, my recent master's uh, thesis. Uh, as well as kind of good ways to build community around the roadside, including the SCA, the Society of Commercial Archaeology, and a few of my uh, favorite roadside attractions. So real briefly uh, about who, who I am, this is me on my first uh, SCA tour back in 2015. Very excited to have found my people uh, and uh, this glorious 1946 White Manna Diner in Hackensack, New Jersey. Uh, I grew up in, uh, in Akron, Ohio, uh, and, and I think kind of came to a love of all of this uh, because we never really flew uh, anywhere as a child. We drove everywhere uh, and uh, lots of road trips, and my dad loved breakfast food, so the places we stopped were diners, the places where you could get pancakes uh, at six o'clock at night, uh, and also saw the, the, the kind of generic suburban sprawl that was happening all around me in the 80s and 90s, and really felt like the roadside was kind of the antithesis of, of that. These places had genuine character. And I think that really fomented my love of the roadside and of preservation, my current, uh, my current career. Uh, and wanted to make sure that these places uh, stayed around so that those unique stories could be, could be told. Was able to take a trip uh, along Route 66 uh, when I was in college, uh, headed out to California like every Midwesterner. California is the epicenter of, of roadside culture. And so I need to get there for a, for a summer and decided to drive Route 66. And incidentally, if anyone is making that California or Illinois trip, depending on your direction, uh, love the maps and guides the National Historic Route 66 Federation puts out. So this eventually led me then to a, to a master's program in historic preservation, uh, which I did at the University of Oregon. Uh, and that, 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 pro, that, that thesis uh, that I wrote there, you can find at the, at the address here at the, up at the top, but I basically looked at uh, preservation tools for, for preserving historic signs in their native environment. Things like vintage sign ordinance, ordinances, facade grants, uh, sign tours, and other tools. Uh, that can be used to protect the, these signs. Um, also did a little bit of history of, of signs and sign regulation, 
tried to explain why, why they are valuable to, to save out in, in the wild and an overview of the current tools and kind of focused on, on Portland, but lots of applicability to, to anywhere in, in the country. Uh, reviewed 20 cities uh, and states around the country that are, that are doing good things with sign preservation uh, and have a set of recommendations. So definitely uh, check, check that out uh, and talk to your I mean, local municipality about saving your local signs. Um, I'm not going to show it here also, but I did do also a pretty uh, thorough uh, analysis of neon signs in Portland, which is really a gem uh, of neon signage. If you have not been up um, to see, definitely recommend it. That's the bottom link um, to that survey of neon signs in Portland, including this awesome white stag sign, which has really become the symbol of, of the city. And I think shows what is possible and the kinds of regulations uh, and ordinances that I have are, are, are kind of put in place. Um, but I do want to show a brief video kind of about this, which I think uh, does a good job of capturing what's so special about neon and how beautiful Portland's are. So that should be playing. There we go. <laughs> Neon is truly an artisan craft, with every bend made by hand. Each neon sign is unique, and they make the places they shine on unique too. If you listen close enough, you can hear the actual buzzing of the electrodes, charging them with electricity. It is really something that is alive. We have more neon in Portland than anywhere I've lived. But there is only a fraction of what there once was, and signs are disappearing all the time. When a community loses its historic environment, it loses its soul. I've realized I'm an advocate for old places at heart, and that historic preservation was the best way to teach people the importance of protecting places that make communities vibrant. A place really does not need to be a Civil War battlefield to be significant. Diners, motels, movie theaters, neon signs are all just as important to preserve as colonial mansions. Unfortunately, a lot of the neon that you see today isn't complete. The signs are still beautiful, but they're missing letters, uh, they're missing tubes, and so you just don't get the complete picture. They've gone dark. I've watched too many places lose what makes them unique because they didn't recognize the value of what they already had. But you can't construct a community's heart brand new. It has to be imbued in a place over time by the people who care about it. My hope is to work with diverse communities to help them recognize the value of their own towns and neighborhoods just as they are. My master's terminal project focuses on how decision makers and advocates in Portland can use a combination of regulations, economic incentives, and public outreach to protect the incredible collection of neon signs here. The good news is that my generation is a generation of preservationists. We want to be in places that are unique, that have character. Right now is a crucial time to enact policies that ensures that the neon gems that define our neighborhoods remain to brighten people's lives long into the future. Advancing to the next slide is not working. Uh, oh, that's not what I want. One quick second. I'm just going to see if that has done it. Uh, I'm going to stop share and reshare. And sorry about that technical glitch, real quick. And da -da -da. And almost there. All right, back in business. 
thanks so much everyone sorry for the technical glitch <laughs> um but again cool cool video my, my slow walking video i call it <laughs> um, but definitely encourage you to check out the paper uh, and also encourage you to check out the society for commercial archaeology which i mentioned that which to for me and i'm there in the in the corner there underneath the big sign and, and many of our 600 members represents the importance of community around the love of the roadside we were founded in 1977 by chester leaves uh, who's the author of uh, Main Street to Miracle Mile, a really seminal book uh, in the study of roadside architecture. And kind of a mixture of academics, uh, advocacy, and enthusiasm around roadside places. A number of the other panelists here are involved or write uh, for, for our publications. We do two great publications uh, every year, four newsletters, and two of these great journals um, have tours, conferences, pop-up tours, Zoom presentations every month. Um, are doing a feature for uh, for Dokomomo as part of their travel and leisure uh, feature for October. So really encourage you if you're into this roadside stuff to to check out uh, check out the SCA. And then I'll just zip uh, real quick through a couple of my my favorite roadside sites. Um, I even bought the uh, little cat's meow for probably my favorite building, the Haynes Shoe House in York, Pennsylvania. There, um, uh, some of my favorite mimetic buildings here. Uh, and then these jug on the right, uh, the earlier top picture there is John Margulies uh, from about 1980, I believe down at the bottom. This is what was the Orange Blossom Jug, now the Pirate's Cove Adult Entertainment Center. Um, but I did a, a National Register nomination uh, for this building. It didn't end up going all the way through um, uh, owner consent issues, um, uh, but a, a very cool building and probably the best example of the medic architecture in Oregon. Uh, here in my current home state, I highly recommend uh, the Forever Tron uh, down there in the corner, the world's largest scrap metal sculpture, and the place where a lot of these cool roadside giants that we all love are created. Uh, you can see a muffler man there in the corner and big boy. This is the FAST fiberglass mold graveyard. FAST is an acronym, fiberglass animal shapes and trademarks. Uh, uh, so awesome. Uh, these are all just kind of sitting out in a field. Um, and so with that, uh, I would say thank you so much from Foam Henge uh, in Virginia, another one of my my favorite sites and uh, look forward to seeing you out on the road. Thanks, Jeremy. Uh, next we have Deborah. Deborah, would you like to share your screen? And start your video. In the meantime, I want to make sure everybody's looking at the chat window because we're posting a lot of things. I posted a bunch in there on SCA um, and roadside architecture. Take it away, Deborah. Hey there. It's really a pleasure to be here. We've got some great people and I'm thrilled to be among them. I'm going to read a quick little bio to those of you that are unfamiliar with me. I'm not, I'm, I'm sort of the, the woman behind the curtain. Um, I've been documenting buildings, signs, and statues for my website, roadsidearchitecture.com, also known as roadarch.com, for more than 20 years. I've driven more than 500,000 miles, maniacally gathering photos from 48 states. My website features more than 2,700 pages and over 70,000 photos. For the past 14 years, I've been writing the feature articles about signs, as well as the sign news columns for the SCA, Society for Commercial Archaeology, which Jeremy just described. Um, I also have a book, Vintage Science of America. And in addition, I have a blog, which is a companion of sorts uh, for my website. I also post some photos to Instagram nightly when I'm on the road. I posted my various links to the chat. Um, I've been interested in buildings uh, since I was a kid. At first, it was those built to resemble teepees teapots, dogs, and the like. As soon as I got my driver's license, I spent every weekend and summer vacation shooting every streamlined modern building in California with the AIA guidebooks for Northern and Southern California in tow. Unfortunately, all those photos faded over the years and were trashed. I lived in New York City from 1980 to 2012 and moved back to California after that. During the past 20 years, I have become obsessed with gas stations, fiberglass, and concrete statues, real diners, fast food chains, mid-century modern buildings, and signs, basically anything from the 1920s through the 1970s. I do have a full-time unrelated job, which pays the bills, and I have four fun-loving terriers that accompany me on all my road trips. When I'm not working or running my hyper dogs, I'm working on the website, adding new things, updating information, and doing research. So that is 
my life, the state of my life. Now you know everything you need to know about me. What I thought I would do with the remaining time is, um, and I didn't start my clock, damn it, um, is less formal. I don't have the pretty presentations that other people do, but I'm going to share my screen. And if I can figure out how to do that, now let me see. And share my screen, this guy. And now, can y'all see my screen? Anybody out there that's not muted? It's coming, it's coming. It's it coming, is. okay. Yeah, it looks good. Okay, well, I can talk over it. What I wanted to do with my remaining time is uh, talk about the best way to use my website since it is so humongous and use it as a reference tool, as well as if I have time, to talk about how you can create maps so that you can have very productive um, road trips. Um, the way, Deborah Jane's method. Um, so anyway, so here is my homepage. If you type in uh, roadsidearchitecture.com or you just type in roadarch.com, this is the thing that will come up. And it's very low tech because I started this 20 years ago when there weren't style sheets, but it gets you around. Um, you'll notice here in the yellow bar, some things, what's new, sort of shows you the road trips things I've been working on. I have a link to this presentation, in fact, there. Um, uh, road trips that are uh, just finished or uh, that I'm planning for the next year or two. The blog, which some people really love. Um, I also have been posting to Flickr since I think 2005. Instagram, some stuff about me, the dogs, if you're really into dogs, my email address and a donation button there. Um, so here are the categories signs, buildings, statues, and other stuff. So this is just the, um, the main categories. And if you click on anything, like let's just click on dinosaurs at random, and you'll see it's broken down by state. Um, some of the other, let me move this down a little bit. I need to get to this bar. Hey, Deborah, um, why don't you go ahead and, and yeah, maximize your window? I, yeah, there you go. <laughs> it's a little harder for me because I keep getting this black thing in the way, but I'll deal. So let's say we go to signs. Um, here we go, signs is right up on top and you click there, then you'll see you have a map and you can just click on the map, but that's not all. Look for, uh, below all the maps on all the main pages, you'll see categories. Like for instance, this is all the um, SEA uh, companion articles. Let's see if I can get to that from here. See, this is the thing I can't get to because of this black bar that pops up on my end. I can't get to what I need. So, okay, so the SCA, I write all these articles, I've been writing for them for like 15 years. And each article that I write, I also include, like if you go to um, Sputnik Signs here, all the other examples from around the country. These blue boxes are also helpful for you because they have links to other things that might be in other sections or that I haven't had a chance to shoot yet or have been destroyed. So the blue boxes are a nice feature. You'll find them scattered all over throughout my website. So things are kind of grouped categorically. So if you were, let's say in Florida, you wouldn't find this, fo this photo here or in Ohio. Another thing I wanted to mention is that when you click on any photo, you'll be able to tell up here in the browser bar exactly when it was shot. Every photo has the year and the month. So you would know that this was shot in August of 2009. So every photo has that built in. So if you're curious about how long ago it was shot, um, let me go here. Let's just go back to signs, for instance. Let's go to Colorado for no good reason. It's very hard for me to limit, as previous speakers have done, my favorites, because everything is my favorite. Um, so let's just click on something here. You can see that that was shot in July of 2012. But then you'll find the descriptions. I try to always include um, the year that it was built or the motel itself was built. Um, any information, I include links throughout to vintage photos if I can find them, to night photos if it's neon, um, that sort of thing, or detailed information about the history of a building. Um, I'll often include links to that because I try to keep my descriptions short. And then the all too critical map so that you can go to Google Street View for every single thing that's still in existence. And you can go here and see things in context, which I think is kind of nice. You can see like what's across the street, what condition is the building in, 
um, all the nuances of the, the thing in place. Um, and then you can, if you don't know about this in Street View, you can use the slider bar so that you can see what did the place look like in 2007? Oh, they demolished the ball, uh, the motel it looks like in 2011, but the sign is still there. So you can cruise around. That's a very nice feature at Street View. Once a year, I go through every single map link at my website, which takes me months, um, every minute of my life to just make sure that the most recent view doesn't show any uh, change, whether something, a building or a sign or a statue has been repainted or demolished and I didn't know about it, et cetera. So I look at every single most recent view at Google Street View. So that's kind of the layout. Um, and then there is the all important search box, which is on every page. So you could type in here, let's say, oh, um, Shelburne Motel. I know that Martin was talking about that, the Shelburne. Now that's gonna pull up a bunch of results that might be interested, interesting to you. Maybe I spelt it wrong, but um, it'll pull up some things and you'll be able to zoom in. Maybe I spelt it wrong, help Martin. In any case, let's try this shell factory. And I know that'll come up. So that is the shell factory has, has a sign. It also has some statues. And then you might wanna look around at other things. Um, I like to refer to, for a lot of people, uh, signs I consider the gateway drug. People get interested in signs and then somewhere along the line, they become interested in buildings or just specific eras of buildings. So the, the results often, will lead you some other things. Let's say you were looking for, uh, let's say you were looking for some small town, let's say Watertown, New York. I have no idea what's gonna come up, but then you could see everything that's there for Watertown, New York. So if you're going there, you might wanna just type that in and go say, oh, what's this gas station all about? And you could see that it's not just a gas station, but it actually has a sign. So it wouldn't be in the sign section because the it's there with the gas station. So that's the um, search bar, the search box. Um, and then if you're really obsessive and you wanna pound through my website, if you have a couple of years to sp uh, spare, I'll go to the homepage here. Down on the bottom, this green box is the site map. So you can see every single page that's at my website. So all the signs, uh, the SEA pages, gas stations, car dealerships, tire stores, Greyhound bus station, diners, eateries, movie theaters, drive-in theaters, five and dime, uh, Crest stores, Woolworth stores, Coca-Cola bottling, bottling plants, um, mid-century modern buildings is perhaps the biggest section at my website, Art Deco Streamline and a few other little categories, the statues, you get the idea, other stuff, fairy tale parks, a few archive sections, so that's another way that you can navigate. Um, okay, let's see now. All right, that tidies that up. I think I, I think I've exceeded my time already. No, I think you're perfect. I think we're ready oh, okay. to, to have. We're ready to go to Ashok. Okay. Um, all right, that's that. Didn't get to the maps. Thanks so much, Deborah. I want to just mention real quick while Ashok's coming on that I've been following your website since I don't know when, since the 90s. I mean, has it been up that long or the early 2000s? It's been it was, forever. It was right around 2000. Yep. 2000. Yeah. Well, great, great work. And we'll see you in a few minutes at the Q&A. Okay. All right, Ashok, are you ready to share your screen? I'm ready. Hi, everybody. Thank you for hosting me again. I'm really excited to be sharing this work with you. And I'm gonna start my clock here and share my screen. There we go. Um, so here I am today talking about my project Gas and Glamour, uh, which is a book uh, around mid-century architecture, uh, mostly developed for the car in uh, Los Angeles. So before I start, my gateway drug is a car because I'm a car guy first, but um, my, my uh, profession or what I do regular, you know, on a regular basis that I'm an architectural photographer um, based in New York City, but I've been going to LA for the last two decades. Um, and ever since uh, I went to LA, for me, um, you know, I love LA for being a city of cars. I mean, to me, LA is the ultimate uh, driver city. And what drew me to it is also the layering of Los Angeles. So on the, you know, we all are very familiar with the highways, 
that I show in the top of it, of this picture of the slide. And then there is the other layering of LA or the layering of streets, which are the surface streets, uh, which existed before the highways were built. And that's where uh, my exploration starts. And that's what I was interested in. And given that I'm a car guy and I'm an interest in architecture as a photographer, um, I wanted to explore that lost design history and kind of go deep dive into why these buildings ex existed, how were they built for the driver, and more importantly, what can I find and what can I photograph? Uh, so that took me about four years uh, to find these things. I used a variety of research, starting from LA Conservancy uh, to websites like Debra's, to blogs, Facebook, city papers, white papers, you name it. Um, and then be, uh, I came up with a representative list of um, locations I would go and try to photograph. My only criteria was it had to be built for the car. It had to be built during a certain time frame and it had to be a living, breathing, functioning business. Um, and that's how I got started. And so let's go into the images a little bit. So uh, this one, for example, is the oldest surviving McDonald's in the country. Uh, it's in Los Angeles in the city of Downey. And uh, as you can notice, there are certain things, uh, there's uh, Speedy and not, uh, you know, as the, as the mascot of, of this restaurant, this was built in the classic Googie style, which you can see these arches and the neon were very much uh, big uh, char design characteristics to essentially bring you in. And again, it's, it's a classic drive up style restaurant, fast food restaurant showing this glass bowl feature, sh showing off the process and the making of burgers. Um, and then there are inst institutions, I would say, and restaurants like this, like the Chips, um, that was built, has a very subtle design uh, element, such as these letter, the lettering, for example, the Chips letters were slightly angled to the direction of traffic so that you can read the signage as you're driving by. Again, the warm feeling with the lighting inside, you just want to go inside and have a cup of coffee on your way home. Um, so again, again, this was built by an um, Italian trained architect and you can see the teachings of Frank Lloyd Wright all over this uh, subtle elegance, probably one of my favorite pictures and locations. And then you have the, these, which are uh, these nautical signs, uh, the, obviously the, the, the neon, the signage, and these letters that light up one by one. Um, and it's almost a spaceship. You go in, you, you just want to stop and look at the structure and uh, obviously go inside. So that was the whole point of, these, um, of this kind of um, architecture where you have this kind of programmatic or mimetic architecture where you can literally have a donut, but why not drive through it? Uh, so you have the donut hole uh, out in East LA. And there's an interesting, um, interesting, I would say, urban myths or um, uh, folkloric legends that, that when you're newlywed, you drive through it for good luck. Who knows? Uh, so, um, you know, things like these just pop up and this is classic Los Angeles and I just couldn't help by photographing them and adding them to my collection. Uh, speaking of more mimetic and programmatic buildings, this is uh, Fleetwood Center, which is a strip mall. And again, you can see this is the front of, of Fleetwood Cadillac. Uh, never had a dealership ever, but uh, it was built in that style. Um, and then to an actual Cadillac dealership from the 1949. Again, you know, the, uh, notice the, the script. It was uh, from the nameplate of a 1949 Cadillac. And it has this indoor outdoor California feel. This again, this glass box feature, usage of glass and the and the foliage inside, this inside outside feel. Once they, you know, you would want to go and see a car and they're you know displayed. It's very commonplace nowadays, but that at that time was revolutionary. Um, and again, the signage and the and the graphic design, I think Mark Martin uh, mentioned that is is one thing I noticed, started noticing more and more. Uh, in these buildings. And then there are obviously gas stations, but this one has a very interesting history. It was built by an architect who also designed the Transamerica Pyramid in, in San Francisco. It was originally going to be in the, in the site plan for LAX, but um, somehow it didn't make it to the final uh, build and ended up being, uh, or we say it took flight in Beverly Hills as a gas station canopy. And um, obviously, you know, why wouldn't you want to stop and you know, pump gas here? It's just, you know, it's just fabulous. Uh, more um, more buildings related to the car. Uh, if you've ever been to Los Angeles or uh, familiar with the uh, with the, the city, these kind of gas these kind of um, car washes are pretty much commonplace. But look at the flamboyance of it. I mean, look at how they were built back in the day, and the and the signage. And uh, it's just not your uh, just a cookie cutter uh, car wash, but it has its own character. It has its uh, you know design elements built into. 
um, built into the structure itself. Um, this is a, the, the, one of the last remaining drive-through dairies in Los Angeles. Um, the parabolic structure was very much uh, significant and the dairy is actually right behind this, uh, this structure which you don't see in the picture. Uh, so the more parabolic arches. And uh, this was built, uh, this is also out in East LA and this um, uh, street called Holt Boulevard. This was uh, popular with people where before Route 10 was built, before the highway came in. So uh, when you zip in down this, uh, this uh, you know, four lane uh, street, you could stop by and, uh, and go in for, you know, uh, you would go in this bowling alley because what, once, what happened was once the city started spreading out, there was more families. And so the people needed uh, something to do and these buildings started sprouting up. And um, then obviously um, motels like this, this is in Pasadena along the uh, parade route and um, the lettering again, uh, signage, we talk about it over and over again, the Moorish uh, lettering and the breeze blocks and the carport were all characteristic features of um, you know, a, a motel like this. And I, I just wanted to capture this uh, design elegance. I wanted to capture this glamor and bring the glamor back into these buildings. So this ended up being a book called Gas and Glamour. Um, I was fortunate that it got um, you know, picked up in, in media and got mentioned in various places. Um, and the book is also structured in a way uh, that you have, it's, it's picture driven, which is a little bit of commentary about these buildings. But the most important feature that I wanna share is here, we have these uh, QR codes, much, much like Deborah mentioned. Uh, you can actually use a QR code to go visit these sites because all we, all I wanted to do is for people to have the same sense of discovery uh, that I had when I was going to, and finding these places. And most importantly, if you want to make these places survive and preserve them, um, we have to go and experience them. Buy a burger, pump that gas, whatever you want to do, whatever you can do. I think that's the best way to preserve these kind of buildings going forward. Uh, so thank you again. That's my website for the book, gasandglamour.com. And um Again, if you use this coupon, Cal um, whatever uh, coupon code California, you can get a 10% off for attendees for this presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks, Ashok. Uh, I just posted in the chat the uh, link to the website that you have there. Thank and you. we'll get back to you in one sec. I have questions for sure. And also thinking of questions, if you if anyone has any questions, go ahead and start posting those in the Q&A and John will get to those in just a few minutes. And it's all yours, Troy. Hello, I'm Troy. My last name is Paiva. Some people say Paiva. It doesn't really matter to me. Uh, but yeah, I've been doing this for 30 years now, um, uh, even longer. I, I started shooting uh, abandoned sites at night in the late 80s, 1989. Uh, and I've been doing it ever since. It started as a straight up roadside thing. I've always been roadside obsessed. I'm a California kid too. Uh, and I grew up in car culture and, and part of car culture. In my 20s, I worked at Galoob Toys as a micro machines designer, uh, little toy cars about that big. Uh, we made thousands and thousands of them, um, hundreds of different designs and paint jobs and all that. I also designed play sets, uh, little tiny car washes and drive through restaurants and stuff. I always tried to make it googie whenever I possibly could get away with it. Uh, and it was a great way for me to like release that architect that was always inside of me, but I didn't have the math skills to uh, actually become. Uh, so I was able to just make these wonderful plan drawings of these buildings and have them made out of injected molded styrene. Uh, that all tied into my knife photography. As I was uh, a kid, I was always on road trips with the family, going out in the car and, and driving across the desert and seeing all this stuff that uh, it's a typical story for, I think, a lot of people that are, have interest in this stuff. So when I discovered knife photography in the late 80s, uh, my brother was at the Academy of Art in San Francisco, Tom, uh, and he was uh, uh, becoming a professional photographer, similar to Ashok. And uh, one of his classes was a knife photography class. Uh, and I was absolutely fascinated with how, uh, with how, uh, the night photography pulled the uh, uh, a completely different atmosphere out of these places, and I immediately associated it with uh, these abandoned places and all these roadside things that I have always been attracted to. So I immediately started shooting this stuff with this technique. Um, so let me get pull up a few here. I've got a few images on deck for you guys. I've tried to pull up old work. Um, uh, 
things, this is from 1990. Uh, this building burned down a couple of years ago. It's a pretty uh, famous place uh, on Route 66 in Southern California. Um, again, 1990 shot with, during the full moon and I used flashlights. Uh, back then I would also use gelled strobes uh, and I'd use snoots and reflectors and all kinds of different things to uh, light the scene. So I work with the ambient moonlight I try to go out in these absolutely the most remote places I could possibly find and shoot by moonlight doing eight minute exposures. On film, you had no idea what you were getting, but I went out and did it. It was a, it was a, 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 with the high stress toy job, well, always a lot of pressure in that gig. This was a wonderful way to release and not be art directed and still go out and do things and make stuff, but not have somebody stand over my shoulder. Can you make it more blue? Uh, please, you know? So I, I really enjoyed that aspect of this, the, the freedom that I had with it. So I'm only showing you things today that are gone now. Um, but you, as you can see by my lighting here, I approach this as an artist first. I'm not, I've never really thought of myself as a, specifically as a preservationist. I realize that the photography is preservation because these things are gone now. Uh, but it wasn't on my mind as I was shooting them. To me, they were just fascinating things from our past they were disappearing. There were, I don't know, 20 of these orange stands on Highway 99 in California Central Valley uh, dating you know, from post-war uh, and most of them were closed by the 80s. This was shot in 95, 1995, it was kind of near Madera uh, and it's gone. This is, I don't think there's any of these left uh, open. I know where there's a couple of scraps of ones hidden around the state in various places. People, some people kept the spherical parts of the buildings. But again, this is you know part of that mimetic thing that we're all talking about. Uh, I'm sure these most of these oranges were actually orange. This this one was probably painted for the bicentennial. Is my guess. <clears throat> Excuse me, my guess. Um, so, camera at a very extreme low angle, extreme wide lenses, shooting upwards into things all the time, uh, trying to get more sky and get more atmosphere. This is all about atmosphere for me. It's not really about. Uh, uh, like I said, it's not really about preserving this so much as it is about preserving the moment of when I was there. Um, I just, I love all these haunted places. It just fascinates me. It's maybe a, a, I saw Harold and Maude too many times as a kid. Uh, but I saw Harold and Maude at this drive-in when I was a kid. This is uh, the Burlingame drive-in. It's a wonderful googie flying saucer shaped building uh, um, kind of uh, in the flight path of SFO. If you ever flown into SFO at night, Back in the old days, you probably saw this drive-in as you were landing. Um, this was where I hung out when I was a teenager. Uh, I closed in the 80s, uh, and it was sat abandoned for I don't know, 15 years before I uh, managed to sneak my way in here uh, and, shut, and shoot it. And within a year or two, it was gone. It, it, the whole site has been raised. I think Google or Facebook has a brand new 10-story high-rise actually on this site that's being constructed right now. So I feel lucky to have been able to slip in here uh, and shoot this place. As you can see, it's, it was pretty heavily vandalized and pretty overrun, but uh, it was a wonderfully atmospheric place. And it was a real gas for me to shoot a, a location that was one that I grew up with. This was most of the places that I shoot, I really don't have that association with. But this drive-in, I mean, I saw a Kansas City bomber on that screen when I was a kid. So it has a real connection for me. And I think all this stuff, this is all about speaking to your history and speaking to people's souls. I mean, this is, that's why I approach this as an artist first. Um, Cause I think that's what really I'm trying to do is, is touch people's hearts with this stuff. Um, so anyway, uh, this is on highway 99. Uh, this was uh, in Delano was the town. You could see this from miles and miles and miles in both directions. Um, I shot this on 4th of July weekend in 15, I think. Uh, uh, and within a year, it was gone. I, you could tell this was going to be gone. The, the coffee shop was was long gone. Uh, and the sign was so rough that uh, there was no way this was. And it was out in the middle of nowhere. You know, uh, I don't know. Maybe it ended up in a collection. It's gigantic. I would say that's probably 25 feet across. But I, I can't imagine where this thing ended up. It probably ended up in the scrap somewhere. Um, wonderful building, though. Uh, I think I ate in that coffee shop once back in the 80s, but I, I honestly don't remember. It was probably pretty bad if, if I did eat there. Look at that font, man. Is that just the best or what? Oh, God, I love it, man. So more recent work. Uh, when I was a teenager, I worked in gas stations. I think maybe that's part of my attraction to gas station architecture and photography. But that's a real big thing for me. 
Uh, I shoot gas stations constantly. Um, I love a good abandoned gas station. There's something about it that just, uh, I've spent hours and hours of my youth standing on pump islands. So the idea of standing on a pump island, this was shot at 3 a.m. Uh, east of uh, Mojave, in between Barstow and Mojave on Highway 58. This gas station came down in 2017. Um, and it's been a magnet for photographers. I, I, every photographer that I know that's ever been down that way stops and shoots this gas station day or night. There's zillions of photographs of this gas station on the internet. It's kind of amusing. It's the North Edwards exit uh, on 58. There was a restaurant on that flat spot out there that burned down a few years before this. But, you know, working with flashlights, so you walk out on camera left, shine red light into the building. It's gonna drop those nice shadows across everything. Uh, a little bit of de deflected light green up in that top right corner just to balance out the grays in there and a little bit of ambient purple light where I'm bouncing the light off of the wall behind the camera and it just kind of fills the room with ambient purple light and the whole idea is that this all just kind of builds up over time. I have thousands of these images now. Um, Flickr is probably your best bet if you really want to get to know my work. Uh, go into Google and type my name. Go into Amazon and type my name and find books. I've done five books. I've done a puzzle. I've been part of, I don't know how many other books. So I've got a lot of stuff for you to look at if you wanted to do that. But uh, lostamerica.com was kind of the start for me that I put that website online in 1999. And uh, it was the first site that you hit. It was the first hit for a search uh, for night photography for a couple of years there. So there was a tremendous amount of traffic to my photography back in 1999. And it's snowballed since then. My first book came out in 2003. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of stuff for you to find out about what I'm doing, uh, if, if this is even remotely interesting for you. This is at the Rockahula Water Park, uh, abandoned water park down near Barstow. Uh, I love this sign because it's kind of, it's this sort of double meta thing where it's celebrating the abandoned roadside, but it's abandoned roadside now. And the, the billboard, which was supposed to celebrate this stuff is actually decrepit now. I just, I love the layering there. Um, and this has now been painted over completely. This whole site is completely covered with graffiti now. Uh, the site technically is still there, but it's a real train wreck. So th those are the only images that I have put aside for you guys. Uh, I just, I, I knew I was going to be, not have much time here. So I just, I kind of wanted to get in real quick, get a few things out there, show you things that are gone now so that we can think about preserving what we have left. The things that are gone make the things we have left more valuable. So that's why I shoot this stuff. Anyway, let's move on, shall we? <laughs> Thank you, Troy. Sure. Um, I love those images. Everybody can go ahead and start your uh, cameras. Uh, I, I felt like I was at the racetracks right there. Oh, anyway. engines. <laughs> Troy, I love the way that you kind of have this sort of meta identity of the roadside, like an abandoned thing, looking at an abandoned thing inside an abandoned, yeah, right? abandoned yeah, thing. Yeah. So um, I wanted to start a question. Well, I wanted to say first that Ashok, thank you for that code. I immediately went to your website and I already bought a book. So thank it's, you. It's very easy. I was so impressed with the things. How did you, where did you find out that rumor about the donut hole? Because I grew up in Los Angeles and I had not heard that. So um, I've been working with a couple of magazine writers uh, coming up with those captions. Uh, the, and essentially, um, you know, this writer who'd been working with me, very prolific and in, into local history. And he said, did you know about this? I said, I had no idea. And he said, this has been written up. And he actually, I said, okay, if you think that, you know, people have mentioned it, I think it's worth mentioning in the book, which I didn't know about. So. <laughs> so we have a question from Margo and, and, and also a, a comment. Um, let me pull it up here. So she's, uh, you, many of you probably see it in the Q and A. There's two parts to this question. So uh, Margo is saying some of these signs and architecture show wealth and they're not pieced together like in poor areas. And I'm, I'm wondering what she means by that. I think what she's meaning is she's talking about sort of uh, self-built architecture, what uh, a lot of people like to call vernacular architecture, right? Um, and so I'm wondering if any of you have any favorite uh, vernacular pieces um, and uh, think about that for a second. And then the second part of the question is, where did many of these things go? Maybe you can provide a few examples of where some of these items went after they were dismantled or demolished. I know with signs, some of them end up in museums. 
Um, so you might have some stories on some of those things. John, you have to make the assignment first. I think we start with Troy. Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. okay. Well, I, you know, I, I don't know where this stuff goes. I honestly don't. I think, unfortunately, uh, uh, well, when I shot the Las Vegas uh, sign graveyard at Yesco, which was, they had a warehouse kind of on the uh, west side of town, and it was where they do all their manufacturing. They had a, a yard on the side of the building it was where they stored their old signs, uh, and they were stacked in there like cordwood. They were just you know, it was awful. And some of them were just in really rough shape. A few years later, they ended up downtown uh, in the compound where the they built the, the Neon Museum eventually. Uh, and I shot there two years later, uh, a few years later. But but that place in west side of town, I, I mean, it's just an example of they don't care. They didn't care. They, and when I talked to the marketing guy about getting in there to shoot it, and he was fascinated with the idea that I even wanted to even bother. Uh, it, it hadn't really caught on that much yet. And now it's in like movies all the time and it's, it's everywhere. And it's, they hold night photography workshops in there. I wonder whose idea that was. Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, so it's like, this stuff is, it just, it's amazing how little most people care about this stuff. So I, I hate to say it, but I think almost everything ends up in landfill. I know that was a long way to get there to say that, but I really do think that. I think most of it is just gone. I could jump in. in. Go ahead. That's okay. Um, I think a lot of it has to do like buildings, obviously, they get demolished. And then the bigger signs, because it's so expensive to move them, you got to get a crane truck. You know, you got to, you know, if you don't own it, you got to get the sign. It, it, it can cost. I know Todd at the American Sign Museum uh, talks about this all the time uh, about how expensive it is to actually uh, transport, you know, take it down and transport it. So the bigger ones um, probably get, uh, you know, demolished. The smaller ones very often end, end up in collector's hands, which is good and bad. Um, you know, if, if it's in someone's uh, little barn somewhere, um, at least it's been saved. But on the other hand, no one gets to see it. Um, so some get donated to museums and uh, both sign museums and like local historic museums. but the majority, I would say, are either, uh, signs anyway, are either destroyed or worse, uh, adapted for another business. Uh, you know, the neon is stripped off, the sign is repainted, so it's just scalped, basically, and someone puts crappy plastic letters on top. So that happens quite a lot. So it's arguable about whether it's good to keep a sign where it is. It's actually in a lot of... Um, uh, vulnerability, if the business is gone, that sign can easily get um, screwed around with, so. Okay, we're looking at some. <laughs> Troy, you were sharing screen your here. screen. <laughs> uh, Jeremy, you wanted to say something about this? Oh, so, yeah, I just going to add right there. There are some some good Samaritan sign companies out there. I know one of the sign companies in Portland that would often, they will, they would essentially take take back uh, any of the signs that they had made as over their 80, 100 year history and store them in their in their warehouse. Some of the signs in that video were, were signs that they, they uh, would would uh, say, we won't charge you for taking down the sign if you just give it to us and would store it. So those, if there are neon sign shops in your communities, um, they some of them may be convinced to at least store them in their warehouses. So there's a question on Facebook about um, a question for Martin. Uh, there was an image that you showed of, of two theaters and um, maybe you could jump back to those. And Jim is wondering where they're located. He said the shorter one on the right was probably Fountain Cinema. Oh, you're muted, Martin. Well, Martin that. is working. I got to unmute. On. Now I'm unmuted. There, there now you I'm go. Here. All right, here we go. Finally, all right. Uh, I believe this is the image that to which they were referring um, in Los Angeles in uh, Westwood. Um, uh, the left is a, a cinema from 1931, 
That's um, Percy Park Lewis. So it's the earlier of the two. The one on the right is by S. Charles Lee, um, which complements the tower, uh, I think, so well. Um, what was the specific question? Just to identify the image. Uh, yeah, the location, but it's in uh, Westwood. I went, actually went by those buildings maybe a year or so ago when the theaters were still closed uh, because of the pandemic and the box offices were uh, covered in plywood. Oh, I see Troy holding something up too. Uh, it's the it's the Lee book. Have you ever seen this book? I love this book, man. It's all. Yes. Thank you, Troy. All, it's all his work. I love that stuff. <laughs> yeah, that is a great book. It really is. It's Absolutely. really good. Yeah. Very cool. God. Yeah. So the sign, uh, or the tower rather, sign tower, these are, it's hard to say which is which. We've got sign, we've got architecture, they're, they're blending. So the sign tower on the left is 1931. The one on the right by S. Charles Lee is 1937. So you can see the streamlined modern, modernism taking over. Um, but I, I think Lee was definitely designing with the other building in mind. I think he was definitely trying to have a relationship with it. I just find fascinating. I think it's great. Yeah, those are great buildings. Well, um, it's time for us to wrap this up. And in the chat, we've had a couple of comments that this was the best CPF webinar ever. So thank you all. I know, right? We win. So thank you all for participating and sharing your expertise with all of our friends and family. And John, you wanted to make an announcement about our next program coming up on Tuesday, right? Yes, please. Um, we do have a, a three part. This is a three part series. So next week, we're going to look at mobile home parks uh, and their importance as housing. We're also going to be looking at some uh, bridge projects, three, uh, three projects uh, from a sort of a regulatory standpoint, uh, the Golden Gate Bridge, the Bay Bridge and the Coronado Bridge. And it's going to be a longer sort of training program. So we encourage you today only you get a 50 percent discount on that program. Today's program was free and you'll find this program on Facebook and YouTube. And I also wanted to mention that my thesis uh, as an undergrad was uh, on the history of miniature golf. So I have a special affinity for this, uh, for this today's program. And I read a lot of John Margulies and Chester Leaves and some of these people. So I'm loving uh, the conversation we had today. I wanted to thank you all uh, for your time and uh, wish you a wonderful rest of the day. I'm going to stop the recording, but I will hey, leave- Hey, John, the... can you put the link to our program, uh, the registration page in sure. the chat? And I want to read your thesis. Come on now. I can't believe you haven't let me read it yet. Uh, again, thanks to everybody. I also want to thank all of our sponsors and donors. And uh, WJE is our education sponsor for our education programs. And because of their support, these programs are free for everybody. So we encourage you to visit uh, CaliforniaPreservation.org and donate or become a member uh, as soon as you can. And also on our website, you'll see all of the 20 winners of our 2020 21 Preservation Design Awards, which we have recently announced, and very soon we'll be announcing our October slate of programs as we celebrate historic preservation. All right, John, I think we're ready to wrap it up. You could have post the, yes, he already did it, the survey on how we did. I did get a couple of uh, people wanted to get a copy of that chat. If you couldn't download it, just uh, email me, chris at californiapreservation.org at C-H-R-I-S, and I will send you a copy of that chat window, which was Recording very active. Stopped. I'll see you all soon. Bye. Bye